but the idea that you can capture that history, get as much of the backstory of it as possible and put it on so that in another 100 and 150 years, people don't have to guess, oh, I wonder where this bottle has been. <laughs> yeah. They know exactly where it's been, <laughs> yeah. who owned it. We don't only need a story. We need a certified story. We need a verified exactly. story. Exactly. By the NFTs, by the history, yeah. by everything. Yeah. We, we need all the records. We need the evidence. And that's what consumers want. I mean, they don't want a piece of dead goods. They want right. something that has a story, that has life to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's something interesting to talk about. Technology, the NFT should be working for you, not the other way around. Hello everyone, this is Mena, your crypto friend. I'm really excited to have Vivian Zhang and Todd Weisel joining my podcast today. Vivian is the founder and CEO of The Spot Room, a Web3 digital marketplace for creators and consumers to buy and trade freely. Todd founded Baxas to evolutionize the way in which the world authenticates and trades luxury assets across the blockchain. The following is our conversation on NFTs with physical collectibles, the definition, application, adoption, and future growth. Welcome to my channel, Vivian Todd. Cheers. Cheers. Mm. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Todd. It's my pleasure. Yeah. Let's start it with a self-introduction as well as a brief introduction to your project. Sure, uh, I can start. Uh, my name is Vivian. I'm the founder and CEO of The Spot Room. We are a Web3 digital marketplace where we partner with brands and creators to create meaningful digital assets, including NFT, for physical objects. And we have a marketplace where consumers can buy and trade. Awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, my name is Todd Weisel, and I'm the founder of Baxis. We're a blockchain-based marketplace uh, for whiskey, wine, spirits, and luxury goods. So we actually take people's private collections, tokenize them, authenticate them, and uh, store them in insured vaults, and then make them available for digital trade. Mm, very cool. So my next question will be, what actually inspired you guys to create Balsos and the Spot Room? Um, so I have been an early follower of um, NFT and blockchain, and I've, you know, I'm very impressed with how much the NFT market has evolved. But I feel like it's lacking the core blockchain technology, where a lot of investors or traders are just chasing the next flip for quick financial gains. So I wanted to. Um, pursue some real-world application of the blockchain technology. Mm -hmm. So I've worked for over a decade in luxury goods and fashion, mm -hmm. so I really wanted to bring that technology into the fashion or retail industry. Mm -hmm. Well, that's awesome, because I actually came from it from like the totally opposite direction, which was I was a whiskey enthusiast, connoisseur, and then eventually whiskey fund manager and trader. Mm -hmm. And what happened was that there was a ton of inefficiency in terms of both figuring out pricing access to you know to liquid markets access to any market um, high fees you know to trade and then ultimately we're doing a lot of global trade you know mm -hmm. bottles are traveling all over the world so just this ability for people to get that instantaneous transaction like we do for anything else as opposed to waiting however many weeks it takes to ship and then the risk of you know the bottle breaking in transit so it was really the idea was to create this new system a new way to trade collectibles in a way where you know both from an environmental perspective because they're staying in one location they're not traveling all over the world but still giving people that you unique sense of ownership on the blockchain. Mm. So I actually came to it from the perspective of I want to build a whiskey marketplace and then blockchain technology and NFTs was the found best. You. Exactly. They found me. That was the best technology um, available to really build out this type of market. Mm. Yeah. So so I think that the, the common theme here is like you guys are both binding physical items to NFTs. Mm -hmm. and. Can you explain to the average user why there's a need to bind the collectibles with the NFTs? Like what's, what's the primary need? What will the users gain from it? So I can start. So yeah. um, for every market, there is the supply and there's the demand. Mm. So on the supply side, for brands and creators, um, NFT gives them an easier way to capture product information. So for our physical goods, everything's going to have a physical chip that will link to an NFT. And they will have information on the provenance, authenticity, ownership, and it will also track chain of custodies. Um, it also gives them a digital twin, something fun to display or to show off in the digital space. Mm -hmm. And on the demand side for consumers, if you are an NFT collector, you are buying something that's backed by physical asset. Mm -hmm. 
So you're not just buying a JPEG file based off um, speculation. Mm -hmm. At the same time, in terms of trading, it gives you a much easier way, a much secure way to trade things. Yeah, that's exactly what we found also, was that the, the NFTs are great for capturing the representation of the good that you have. Um, you know, in our case, these high, high resolution 360 scans of the bottles that you're purchasing. Um, but at the same time, giving you still that same digital ownership where it's not like you have to worry, you know, come through our servers or come through us. You can trade this, this asset on any, any digital market, any NFT marketplace, um, you know, that, that allows for trading of, you know, NFTs. So that was, uh, that was really like a big element for us of why you know, put this on chain. And similar to what Vivian said, there was now what we're noticing is a real world use case because people who actually realize like, hey, instead of buying something purely on speculation, like this product, you know, this, this project just minted yesterday and how do I know that this isn't some scam that's being pumped mm -hmm. and dumped? Yeah. It's, hey, you know, we provide on our, on our, on the Baxis platform mm -hmm. years and years of historical pricing data. So you can make educated decisions. So it's the idea that now if you're looking to get into something new, if you're looking for something to uh, collect or to trade or to invest in that you you know, now it's giving you a chance to do that in something that you understand better. I know this brand, I know this spirit, uh, you know, this whiskey, I know mm -hmm. this wine, I know this handbag, you know, designer. Mm -hmm. It gives you a lot more education than when you're competing, you know, even in just traditional financial markets against, you know, mm -hmm. hedge funds and massive, yeah. massive, you know, pension funds in a stock market where how much information could you possibly have over, you know, over them? Mm -hmm. I have actually several questions regarding your answers, right? The first question is for an average user when they are picturing the relationship between the NFT and the physical goods, right? How could they tr tr make the transactions, right? Can they sell the physical goods together with NFT or separately from the NFTs? So in the Baxis case, um, each bottle that comes in also gets attached to the physical chip that then represents it online. It gives you all the transaction data, metadata, mm. but the bottles themselves, as long as they're tradable on our platform, remain inside of our vault. Mm. So the idea over there is that what your, that your NFT is digital representation of ownership mm. of that actual unique one of one bottle or cask or barrel of whiskey. Mm. So what's going on in this case is you're not redeeming the bottle and the NFT. When you redeem a bottle from us, because you want the physical good, the NFT goes into a vault, into an, a digital archive where people can still see all of the history and all of the provenance and you can still see all the information when you scan it on your phone. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's no longer in your wallet to trade because so it's, it's not, well, so it's not quite burned because mm -hmm. the NFT still exists and if that bottle mm -hmm. comes back to us and we rescan it and it goes through the authentication process mm -hmm. and it's the same bottle, that NFT leaves the archive and the vault and goes back into the new person's wallet so mm -hmm. the chain of provenance isn't broken. Oh. But it's held in, you know, this actual secure digital, you know, cold storage is ledger. Your treasury? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. It's a cold storage treasury that basically doesn't allow for people to then, you know, touch it, or touch it exactly or use it. And the idea being that there's only one in circulation at a time. Either the NFTs out there in the open market mm -hmm. or the bottles out there in the open market. So okay. what that when you then what that bottle will then represent is that token represents the bottle, and the bottle when you have it is linked directly because of the chip to the mm -hmm. token. So you scan it with a, you know any NFC reader on your phone, mm -hmm. pulls up that all the metadata, the provenance, the ownership. Mm -hmm. Um, and everything about the bottle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so similar to what Ta said, the way I see it, the NFT is like the ghost or the spirit of the physical item. So they're always traveling together. Mm -hmm. There is a process where you can decouple them. But again, I feel like every marketplace is trying to invent, you know, like a, a better process mm -hmm. or better system. So the way we work is that once it's decoupled, um, the NF you, you can trade the NFT for its own digital value, mm. but then you are losing sort of the value of the physical item because mm. the authenticity and ownership is no longer traceable on a blockchain. So um, we don't currently don't have a process for us to re-authenticate only because we're working with multiple brands. Mm. So it is up to the brand for them mm. to maybe collect the item back, authenticate, and then bring mm. it back. Because we don't have a physical storage. We work with, we're, we're, we're a marketplace, mm. we're a technology provider. Mm. So we work with brands, they come to us, we create the, the digital asset for them, mm. and then they have that direct shipping, and, um, uh, shipping and storage relationship with the consumers. So they are also responsible for the authentication Process. Yeah, yeah. So you are assuming anything you buy from the primary marketplace on our platform is authenticated because you're getting directly from the source. Mm -hmm. In the secondary market, we, you know, it is between um, the buyer and the seller. Mm -hmm. But we do have a system where the buyer verifies the authenticity and assuming it's still attached to the chip, attached to the NFT, where once they verify, then we complete the transaction. What about you guys? So we actually run the authentication in-house. Yeah. Um, that's something that we built out because it's a service, at least in our industry, it's different again in the spirit space. Mm -hmm. It's something that's really necessary and needed. There's 
tons of cases of, of wine fraud, of, of the whiskey mm -hmm. fraud, you know, mm -hmm. people refilling bottles, people are, um, you know, taking labels off of one bottle and attaching it to another bottle. So there's a lot of fraud. So we have both a team of experts that we've partnered with, mm -hmm. um, including, you know, there's this really big uh, Justin's House of Bourbon. They're this huge, you know, secondary market, real, real marketplace in physical marketplace in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. So at the heart of, you know, bourbon country. Mm -hmm. And so we partnered with them. So they actually authenticate the bottles as they come through Baxis's platform. So we're able to take people's, you know, private collections. Mm -hmm. So we're, your solution is for the primary to secondary market, which is yeah. something that we are not working in right now, actually. We're solving the peer-to-peer -peer secondary, -peer secondary market, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and then the idea is eventually, you know, spirits brands will most likely want to come, you know, through our platform and mm -hmm. push their products direct to consumer, mm -hmm. use our data channels to figure out mm -hmm. who the best people to target are based on collections. And because mm -hmm. that's one of the other benefits of blockchain is you get all of this anonymized yeah. metadata that you can use to create profiles without having to, you know, infringe upon the privacy of your users. Yeah, right. that's, that's right. Yeah, that's also another benefit to the brands that we partner with on our platform is mm -hmm. that historically they don't have any um, insight into Risa activities. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But by having attaching an NFT to the physical item, you not only can, can collect data on resale, you can al always have that CRM relationship with whoever the current owner yeah. is, mm -hmm. and they can collect royalty on resales. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. that's something that's brand new for the retail and luxury goods industry. Yeah, trace the exactly. Yeah. And also actually own your top 100 customers. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. absolutely. Yeah. Um, but in our case, where you have, let's say, like different uh, distilleries that want to do partnerships, or let's say, we can now say, hey, owner, these owners own your product and this other brand's product. So you guys are a natural collab partner because you have such overlap in your customer base already. Or here's a, right, uh, exactly. Or here's a, here's a customer who doesn't have any of your products. You might want to target them because they're buying from your, you know, your competitor's products, mm -hmm. but you might have something that's similar or yeah. you think is a superior product. You can now offer it instead of having to, you know, throw up a billboard on a bus and hope that there's like somebody sees it and it catches their attention. Mm -hmm. You can directly target the users who you're really yeah. looking for. Mm, I see. I think the marketing in Web3 will be different. Then. Yeah, yeah, because mm -hmm. you have all these data that you're not able to track in the past. <laughs> yep. And then the second question that I want, want to ask you guys is, because physical goods in the real world, it always comes with the pricing, right? No matter whether it's a one of one limited mm -hmm. edition or it's like a non-selling piece, but still it will have a price coming to that. But the NFT world, especially for the digital arts, right? Mm -hmm. There's no price cap for it, mm -hmm. or there's no price floor for it. So what, I guess when we are dealing with NFTs that ha has an associated physical goods, are you guys concerned about that? Or how do you view about that issue? Does it put a, an actual price cap to the NFTs? It's a great question. So I don't know if it sets a cap because you have, well, I'll look at this from two directions. One of them is, it definitely sets a floor because the idea is because we're tra you're trading a unique, legitimately physical good that represents the same, you know, it's the same good that exists in the real world. Mm -hmm. If the bottle that you're looking for is a thousand dollars on every shelf, there's no reason why somebody should sell you that same bottle for less than a thousand dollars. So you're pretty much setting the floor as the real world, you know, at a liquor store, at an auction house, wherever it's available on the other, you know, in the physical markets. Um, the as far as a ceiling, the advantage you have from, again, this integration to the NFT, the ease of sale is how much does that get factored into price? The ability to resell something, the ability to keep something stored and insured, the ability to uh, use, you know, your assets now for collateral, because that's one of the other benefits is now that you have all these bottles that we have historical market data for, mm -hmm. you can actually, and they're stored and they're insured, you know, you can actually go to one of our lending partners and take out a loan and say, hey, I've gotten a thousand dollar bottle, can I borrow $500 against mm -hmm. it? So your bottles become actual real valuable assets as a opposed to now where it's, you can sell it at an auction, you can try and do a private sale, mm. but ultimately it doesn't have that same type of intrinsic asset value. Mm. Um, oh, be careful with what you're talking exactly, about. Exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly, that's the thing. Yeah, so that, that's that's the, the point over here is that these are real, you know, these are real goods. They are real goods with real real world pricing. Mm. Um, at the same time, sure, it, it, you know, it somewhat limits it in the sense that you're not gonna get a bunch of people who wake up one day and pump, you know, up this NFT for right. no reason. Yeah. But I view that as a benefit, not a downside, because I think what we've seen with every single NFT that's hit like all time highs is they come crashing down because they're not trading on any fundamentals. It's literally just people FOMOing in thinking, oh no, I'm missing another massive one. And then eventually the buying stops. And as soon as the buying starts to slow down, the asset starts to crash 
crash because people were purely speculating that, hey, if I buy it now, in 10 minutes it'll be worth more, as opposed to I'm buying this because I've looked at its historical pricing. I think that it still has room to climb. I, I understand the uniqueness of the proposition, whether it's an article of clothing, a handbag, um, a piece of jewelry, uh, you know, in our case, a bottle of whiskey. Um, yeah, you start to, I think you start to just see the market a little bit differently when you're looking at historical information versus something that just showed up on the market yesterday and it's purely digital. And like you said, there's no way to really give it a sign of a price yeah. or a value. So for us, because our model is slightly different, mm -hmm. so we have, I guess we're in luxury goods, so we have more creative license to create NFT. So the way we work with our brand partners is that the NFT is not just gonna be like a 3D realistic view of the physical item. Mm -hmm. We have, we, we partner with artists and musicians to create some original digital oh. art that's also collectible. Mm -hmm. So with that, we're adding value to the physical item. So there is always a floor price, but the cap is really depends on how much people's willing to collect like that one of a kind physical and digital item. Got it. So it's actually the collaboration that yeah. makes it more valuable. Right. So in the way we see it, because fashion clients love to show off things and, and you know brag about things. Mm -hmm. So we give them the ability to show off something digitally mm -hmm. of something that's verified on a blockchain that they truly have ownership of something that also looks beautifully digital. I mean in the in the metaverse mm -hmm. versus taking a picture of yourself wearing a shirt trying to, you know, five different poses. Mm -hmm. So so that so that's value. And then with that we're also able to create some AR VR effect to really jazz up the physical item. So giving it a life in a different dimension. Mm -hmm. I, I think what I learn from like what you guys just said is like first of all what taught you said is if we can get the transparent information about the pricing history people could be a better investor in right. those kind of things which they may never had the information before because for ours for limited items for luxury goods it's always like a, a market that average users they don't know about it right and for you what you're saying is more like a, a combination of the okay the newly like digital arts mm -hmm. plus the luxury goods Right. and will create a, kind of a new form of mm -hmm. NFT or luxury goods. Because I guess our consumer group is slightly different. You mm -hmm. probably deal with mostly investors, where we, we deal with half, like part investors and mm -hmm. part consumers. So fashion consumers love to, you know, they love to have things, mm -hmm. whether it's digital things and physical things. Mm -hmm. So we're really creating that best of both worlds. And with that, our pricing, you know, we have more power in pricing. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I'd say that our target, or not even target, but our you know current, like our real you know core user base right now are exactly either collectors who who might be consumers. They might actually call their bottles one day because mm -hmm. you can redeem your NFT for a bottle and they'll ship it to you. Mm -hmm. And they might actually want to drink it one day, but for the most part, they're either collecting it, um, you know, for the physical and digital collection, or investing in it. So. Yeah, there's less of the need. No, you know, once you open the bottle, the the yeah. value is gone. It's not like you can wear the sneaker, yeah. the watch, the sweatshirt, and then sell it on to someone else. Um, mm. So that's definitely, I'd say, a different, like a different part of yeah. our of our audience. Another fun thing that I can mm. think of with the attachment of NFT is that, like, say, say in auctions, if something mm. was once warm and owned by a physical person, the mm -hmm. value also goes up. Mm -hmm. But in an auction, it's harder sort of to verify that you might have a picture. But how do I know it's this exact item that was warm? Mm. Yeah. Now, not, now with NFT on the blockchain and you can see the change of hands. I'm actually right. thinking, mm -hmm. so I, I was always very interested in the on-chain identity and everything, and now when we bring the identity of the collector or the investor into the picture, mm -hmm. when the user knows who is actually collecting it, it actually contributes the value to the NFTs or, or your brand, whatever you call yeah. it, right? Yeah, so, so anything that is tradable in the mm -hmm. future has this historical value to it, meaning that, that you know, the context, the change of hands, it's, go, it's gone to, like my background is in jewelry. Any diamond or mm -hmm. gemstone that's been once owned or mounted on a famous person's mm -hmm. jewelry is worth a lot more. Right. So how do you capture that? value and be able to back to, to and be able to back it up so blockchain provides the means to back it up and then the value is really generated by market mm -hmm. and we're able to you know and then for as a marketplace we have the, the data the insight to help them make those pricing decisions yeah, I mean, that makes sense. And for us, one of the other, you know, cool and really core components about how we designed our NFTs is that, you know, they're also time capsules. So in the sense of, like you said, it preserves mm -hmm. both who the owner was, but in our case, we have a lot of people who buy whiskey because, you know, it ages, it matures, it has a vintage. So they buy it, you know, mm -hmm. for a specific birth year as a gift for someone. So the ability on ours to actually preserve that information as well. So when you have a master distiller who, you know, distills a whiskey and he records a video and he stores it in one of our on-chain databases and that you know, it's linked to the metadata 
metadata of the NFT, mm -hmm. you're not just seeing like, oh, this is you know such and such bottle. It's this is the guy who made this bottle. This is what went into it. When a father you know buys something to yeah. collect for for his child, uh, yeah. you know, for his child, you know, to give to them at their 21st birthday, and he buys a bottle the year that they're born. Mm -hmm. um, the ability to record that video and to and to leave them that permanent memory attached to the bottle mm -hmm. and to the NFT itself, like that's a big part of what we do also. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a cool thing about like you were saying in terms of use cases for these mm -hmm. NFTs that in our case, if you're looking to preserve not only value but provenance information history, mm -hmm. then if somebody owns a piece, um, whether it's a you know famous you know one point designer piece, um, you know that they owned or was in their family, yeah. or whether it's a really unique bottle of wine or whiskey that was gifted to someone by this you know and has this crazy mm -hmm. backstory, you can actually link those stories completely to the item so that it's not just the myth and legend, yeah. but the actual you know it's attached. You can, as far as the story goes, verify it, but actually see yeah. the, it being told in the original yeah. words. And that's what consumers want. I mean, they don't want a piece of dead goods. They want right. something that has story, that has life to it, yeah. so that's something interesting to talk about. No, yeah. it's, it's so true. Um, like one of the big things that's been coming into the vault now is we've been getting a lot of bottles from uh, the Prohibition era, mm. which is like some of the coolest whiskey because wow. it's like a real piece of American history. It's yeah. like distilled in 1917 and then it wasn't bottled till 1933 speakeasy. exactly or like speakeasy <laughs> releases because these things some of them are actually released earlier over prohibition and they say for medicinal use only like on the labels because yeah. it was you know it was all these cool laws and what you're owning is a piece of history and unfortunately anyone who's really owned and interacted with these bottles is long gone but the idea that you can capture that history get as much of the backstory of it as possible and put it on so that in another 100 and 150 years people don't have to guess oh I wonder where this bottle has been <laughs> yeah. they know exactly where it's been yeah. who owned it. Can I say, like, actually, the users can expect more from the marketers or from the brands because we don't only need a story. We need a certified story. We need a verified exactly. story exactly. by the NFTs, by the history, yeah. by everything. Yeah. We, we need all the records. We need the evidence. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a, yeah. And, and that's a big thing of what we're doing also is preserving for these distilleries, like, information and data and stuff mm -hmm. on chain. Like, we're working with them to build these digital archives mm -hmm. for exactly that purpose so that when a company trades hands or there's a new creative director, they're not losing all that institutional yeah. knowledge. There's still that ability for them to you know, yeah. ca tap into the brand yeah. before them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Actually, if we take the romance out of the storytelling, that the, that the utility behind it is really critical. Like yeah. I was talking to a friend over the weekend. He's renovating his, his house, which is uh, historical. It's old. And then the contractor came in was like, I don't know where they got the tiles from. It looks really nice. I don't know where the, the, fit, the light fixture is from. The way I see in the future, anything physical should have a, should have a, a digital twin in NFT. Yeah. And then imagine five years from now, the contractor can come in, use their cell phone to capture the information of that very tile and say, okay, it was bought from this person, from this store at what time, and are there still anything left? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or if it exists and somebody else has a has them sitting in like, you know, one of these resale stores. Yeah, yeah. Sitting, he's like, okay, I found these tiles in this 15 different locations. 100%, yeah. I totally mm -hmm. agree. The inventory is gonna totally mm -hmm. change with yeah. this idea of having the phys physical digital yeah. twin. Yeah. yeah, the reason why I'm enjoying our conversation so much is because we are attaching or we are actually like connecting us or connecting yeah. the crypto world, the Web3 world uh -huh. into the real world. Yeah. And I, I think this is what's really going to benefit the users in the long term or or actually like the user will mm -hmm. start to actually realize oh what can we use or what, yeah. why are we adopting the blockchain technology for those different mm -hmm. things because it's adding more yeah. actual value the real world use case mm -hmm. yeah. to our life yeah, yeah. actually another point i wanted to raise mm -hmm. is that for me to working for me to be working with the creator from from the source is that there is a sustainability um, angle to it mm -hmm. so if let's say we are operating a model where once an nft is sold, Sold and then an item is made to order that will solve the overproduction issue. Mm -hmm. And then, as we are giving the creators and the brands more access into resell data and encourage them to make quality, long lasting products mm -hmm. so that they can collect a royalty, that's also another way to mm -hmm. sort of move away from fast fashion to quality fashion. Mm, that's such a great economy. point. That is such a great point. Yeah, and yeah. then also if by giving the, the user sort of a digital twin to wear, mm -hmm. we're extending the product life into different dimensions. So that they get more um, return on their IP value as well. Yeah, um, I gotta completely emphasize on the creator economy because I 
luckily I have worked with a lot of digital artists before on the NFT side because of my previous like projects. And and when I talk to them, and it's totally like a game changer for them when they enter the NFT space, mm -hmm. they get more sure about the artwork. Mm -hmm. Some of the creators, they are like famous for large gaming studios or the world-class studios in the world, but they don't get paid that much. Exactly. So a chance into the NFT world, and they, they actually can earn 80% of it is like, unbelievable because usually maybe they will get like one percent or five percent or or what's even worse in the music industry only the top one percent will get paid and then the remainder of it they they just do it for love and peace yeah i mean there's a <laughs> there's a guy in one of the nft marketplaces that i know well who does like uh, nft poetry where like he writes up these poems and he mm -hmm. like publishes each of them as an nft mm. and people buy them and it's like such it was to me i was like wait that's such a clever idea because like you're creating something it doesn't it doesn't need to not like you want it to be seen it would appear in a mm -hmm. book or something but you'd have to publish a book of poetry to be able to sell it and get an yeah. editor to pick up your book and to pick up your copy and who are you as opposed mm -hmm. to here if somebody finds it to be beautiful they're like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna buy that. And you know, yeah. exactly. And then if they sell it to someone else or they gift it to someone, like he has that attachment and that link and like, you know who wrote it, He's he can theoretically earn off of it, you know, in perpetuity. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think Recreation. that's really cool. Based on that, and then yeah. they can they can all like contribute to the ecosystem. Yeah. yeah. And that's, yeah, I think that the, and that's like a big part of what you're saying, this, this elimination of like from a sustainability perspective, because mm -hmm. that's one of the elements that we have as well is when I was trading privately, I, I can remember one like specific of a time where I ordered a bottle that came from the UK. So it was shipped from the UK to New York. Mm. Then the bottle went from New York to a buyer in California. Mm. Then there was another buyer who requested the bottle and he was based in Hong Kong. So the bottle went from California back to me in New York, mm. then to Hong Kong. Mm. Then it was sold to somebody in Singapore and then it was sold back to somebody in New York. <laughs> so at the time, this bottle, theoretically, everyone just wanted to prove that they owned it. They wouldn't have cared if that bottle had stayed in Scotland, you know. <laughs> but every at the same time because there was no system or way to prove you own something that isn't in your possession or mm. no like effective way yeah. this bottle instead had to be shipped all over the world back mm. and forth and, and like you know especially through my hands to be like okay can you authenticate make sure that nothing was tampered with when the last guy owned it mm. so if you can keep these things and you know authenticate them once put them into you know put them into a vault or you know attach a tip to them and let them out into the real world so that the brand can rehandle authentication yeah. mm. you've saved like you said as far in the fashion space unnecessary production and in mm -hmm. the good space mm. Shipping in, the carbon in, emissions. Exactly. exactly, all the carbon emissions. Yeah. These things are getting loaded onto planes, onto ships, you know, onto, yeah. into cars, into trucks, like, as opposed to just sitting in one place yeah. and saying, I'm just going to trade the proof of ownership because that's really all I want, anyways. Mm. Yeah. I want the value of the item. Yeah. Exactly. And on the fashion consumer side, if, if we're making it much, much easier for them to trade things, mm -hmm. then we're enticing them to spend more money to invest in quality pieces that they can resell mm -hmm. later on instead of gravitating towards the fast fashion because it's cheaper and it's hard to resell. Yeah, it, it makes so much sense. Like I, you know, coming into this alternative kind of asset space mm -hmm. from whiskey, I started to learn about other, you know, these other markets. Like I, you know, my wife had like showed me about like the handbag market and I was fascinated to learn that there's like this huge secondary resale market yeah. on luxury handbags and it's like, hey, if you make a quality product that will last 50, 60, 100 mm -hmm. something years, mm -hmm. People are going to buy it and they're going to resell it because it'll it can it can li it can last that yeah. long. Yeah, and the idea of giving them an ability, I almost feel like Web three solves, like you were saying, solves a fast fashion problem, which was from a brand perspective, it wasn't cost efficient to make things that lasted because that means people were buying fewer new goods, mm. and so they wanted to sell more, so they sold things that would rip and tear and you know, only lasted one season. Right. But if you're able to profit off of something in perpetuity, mm -hmm. you want it to last as long as possible. Right. So I think that that's like a really cool way that that's going to just change. Um, yeah. creator behavior and yeah. you know, brand behavior. I, I think another concept I, I, I want to bring to our conversation is a, a, a community, because Web3 is completely community driven, mm -hmm. whatever community you're talking about, right? People, they are in specific like projects community or they purchase certain NFTs because they feel they belong to that community or they want to be become part of that community. So I think that's also good like for us to think about, oh, when we are actually purchasing those NFTs with the physical goods, what kind of community are we trying to nurture out of this, right? What does this mean? Like, are we acting as a gateway between the real world and the Web3? Is it a com combination? Like, what are you guys' take on on that? 
Mm. I think NFTs make community building a lot easier because mm -hmm. in the past, if you're a physical only product, maybe your only access to your consumer is their email address. Mm -hmm. maybe, you're, maybe if you're lucky, you can get their text numbers. Mm -hmm. And then what you can get is maybe certain emails you know, a, few, a few times a year, and then maybe you can get them to some certain in, like, in real person events. But now with this NFT, you can, you have, you can have a lot of virtual gated, like token gated events mm -hmm. digitally in the metaverse. In yep. the metaverse, I know it's, you know, it's not there yet, but I feel like it's giving it's, us a lot of hope there. that we could extend our, you know, brand loyalty and um, consumer engagement into a different, completely different dimension. Yeah, no, that makes that makes perfect sense. And, and honestly, it's funny you mentioned that because in the spirit space, like as opposed to a fashion brand where I can walk into Chanel and I can buy something from them and give them my, you know, email address. When it comes to the the whiskey and the liquor industry and wine, it's almost impossible to buy directly from the producer mm -hmm. because in the U.S. there's all these like you know different tier systems right. and laws. So you actually have to go, you know, they sell it to a distributor who sells it to a liquor store who mm -hmm. sells it to a consumer. So the liquor store might have your contact info and the distributor has the liquor store's contact info mm -hmm. and the brand has the distributor, but they don't actually know each other. Those parts of the chain are not communicating. So the end consumer doesn't really have a relationship with the producer in a way that the producer might want mm -hmm. to be able to like invite them to an IR, you know, to an in, in real life event yeah. and, and, and to do, you know, to really engage with them. Yeah. So mm -hmm. Web3 definitely changes that element of community and it also allows for verified community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been in as much as Discord can be really overwhelming because there's just so many. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of the cool things about a lot of these protocols like um, Grape or some of these other ones is that it allows, it checks your wallet and verifies that you have the correct mm -hmm. NFT to get into a certain chat. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't even have to do with, let's say, like metaverse events, yeah. even if it's just like, hey, I want people who own this brand of whiskey or I want people who bought this specific sweatshirt mm -hmm. because we all want to talk about it together but we want to talk about it together in private yeah so you can actually verify that the owner has that mm -hmm. nft and they're not just someone who's you know pretending that they own it or posting about the you know some some picture they stole from somebody else's Instagram and posting mm -hmm. it on their own and pretending they own it like you can really verify that people own these things yeah. um, which I think is actually really important even just from like an Instagram perspective mm -hmm. yeah um, I was thinking that like you know <laughs> when you have marketing right all these people posting yeah. about how incredible they're their life is and it's all like some yep. they're sitting on somebody else's car and yep, they're you know yep. wear, wearing rented you know yep, jewelry absolutely. and it's like hey they're like really making people feel like oh my god I'm so behind yeah. because this person is so farther ahead of me and really it's like yeah. all fake when you're verifying ownership if it's mm -hmm. like hey I've got this really cool new you know blazer yep. and you bought it through um, you bought it through you know your, your platform mm -hmm. um, and then all of a sudden everyone's like Okay, but do you really own it, and then they can go and check, the, you know, the NFT from the picture, or check, you know, check on chain and say like, yo, you you don't own that. You were yeah. borrowing it from your friend who was yeah, behind yeah, the camera. Yeah. Like yeah. that's actually a very very good point. Like in the luxury goods mm -hmm. world, where it is, you know, like the ultra uh, high net worth individuals usually have personal shoppers. Mm -hmm. yeah. So those personal shoppers just go out and you know, on paper they are these big spenders buying everything left and right, but, but they don't own owner. them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also from from the brand's perspective, they're not really getting the data on who the at the end consumer consumer mm -hmm. is and uh, there's difficulty connecting with those consumers yeah it happens yeah it happens. which is why brands spend so much money throwing these in-person events exactly. to get them in to see who actually owns them they're trying to find out who are our actual yeah. users exactly yeah. is it is it fair to say actually like oh, okay it's harder for the scammers or, or the brands mm -hmm. to tell lies to to lie about certain stories mm -hmm. but it's also like harder for people to fake their ownership because like this just raised a bar for yeah. everything yeah and then this kind of force average people to stick choose to who they are, who they belong to. Yeah, I, I would say but that. This is such a like philosophical question, you know. Yeah, uh, but at the same time, you're right. It'll hurt like brands that you know try and pretend that things that aren't limited are they're like oh really limited release and it's like they made like mm. hundreds of thousands of them. So it'll stop them from doing that because if you're trying to link every product to an NFT. Mm. We can see how many NFTs you minted. Mm. So it's like, okay, you claimed you only sold 5,000, but there's 100,000 NFTs. So yeah. which one is it? But at the same time, it'll also, like you said, it'll prevent, um, it'll really prevent like, you know, consumers from pretending they own things that they don't mm. own. It's like, okay, well, you only made, they only made 500 of these and I see 8,200 profile pictures or people advertising that they own it. So yeah. something, something's a little yeah, bit wrong yeah. over yeah, here, yeah, yeah, yeah. which I think is, oh. is yeah, going to be an interesting way to, it'll shake out in an interesting yeah, way. Yeah, that's, I think that's interesting. And, and we need to wait for the time to tell us how this is going to play along. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because um, I think this is in the interest of, of a lot of different parties mm -hmm. and this is going to affect 
like different parties perspectives or, or lives so 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 I I'm just curious about like how this going to go yeah I, I think also it will help brands I'm like thinking from from what you were mm -hmm. saying and that people will be able to see real life data so sure it could start you know you'll, you have to be careful about certain manipulation let's say but how did these streetwear brands, you know, get really popular? Like mm -hmm. it starts off really small underground. They hit a couple of influencers, people. But imagine if you could start watching in real time, and all of a sudden you notice on your, you know, on the trading platform, like, wait a second, this one brand I've never heard of is selling like they just sold out like a thousand pieces. Mm -hmm. Like it's selling like people are buying their real goods, like the custom, yeah. you know, made-to-order goods that you guys are selling. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you know, have exposed the entire world to saying like that's going to be a brand that's about to get. Because if I look mm. at the other stuff that those people own, because remember now you could look, these are people who own, let's just say, you know, from the NFT world, mm -hmm. these are bored apes or people who own like you know, really high, impressive, Fingers. exactly, yeah. exactly, really like you know, blue chip NFTs are also buying yeah. this brand of sneaker right. or sweatshirt you know what or. Strikes mm -hmm. me. Mm -hmm. Have you guys the three HC clubs? Like everybody mm -hmm. was watching that. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at the three AC? collection, mm -hmm. NFT collection, they have amazing NFT collection. Right. Damn, mm -hmm. I was looking at that, I was like, oh, wow. And, yeah, again, and eventually it'll just, you know, someone will liquid the, some right. bankruptcy court will liquidate it when they need to sell yeah. off assets. So I, you know, I, I still think that we're very early in the mm -hmm. whole Web3 and blockchain movement. Right. So transparency is great. But, um, but there are certain incidents where transparency might not be as good. So first of all, if you're a brand, if say if you're a private company, do you really want all of the information to be searchable on oh, the blockchain? Sure. That's why we have uh, privacy on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. Right, and then I was asking another question the other day, was like, so every, if mm -hmm. anybody can look up your NFT, what if you give to someone something and then that person look look it up, say, oh, you only spent $5 on this? Like, is this like, so So oh. there, were, I, I think a lot of other things that we have to consider to actually build, you know, like the perfect system. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. That's a really, really great point. Yeah. Um, and I think you're right that a lot of different systems, right? There's privacy on the blockchain, there's private blockchain. So, like, business, I would not want, you know, businesses wouldn't want their books, like every single financial transaction. Yeah. That's where it's like, oh, why aren't they accepting? It's like, imagine yeah. if you could forecast their revenue because right. you could look at their Ethereum wallet and see how much how, how much Gucci is selling this month, mm. you know? That wouldn't be great for public companies, for earnings, mm -hmm. for things like that, or even, you know, for private companies. Yeah. But at the same time, I do think that there adds that element of like, hey, what if we can disintermediate a little mm. bit of like the. Mm -hmm the person to person element where you can do this trustlessly where yep. if we say we our collection has sold x mm -hmm. amount you can log on and say like yeah they, they actually did sell x amount you know yeah. I, but, so i, I do yeah, hear so like point a public though. verifiable right. the, I, I think this is more like um, i talk to a lot of like projects right i think like especially privacy or those verifiable transactions mm -hmm. this should be a choice for the users so i mean what you are saying is more like from a psychological pers perspective or mm -hmm. like when you are in like different complicated situations maybe people or the user needs are different, but but essentially, I think verifying the transactions or verifying all the information should be a choice for mm -hmm. the users. They can mm -hmm. do that. Like, okay, well, of course, it depends on whether they want to do it or not, right? Um, mm -hmm. Based on different situations, mm -hmm. but they need to have that choice. Yeah. And that's what we, as like the real. Uh, people who are working in the Web3 industry should strive for. That's, yeah. mm -hmm. that's my thinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with you. The, the choice should be given, mm -hmm. and then it's up to the user to decide how they want to use it. Oh. Yeah. Exactly. Couldn't agree more, which I yeah. think now there's like certain people are working on credential NFTs, like mm -hmm. this exact thing where it's like you can create a, an identity that will verify you are real, you know, KYC, but isn't mm -hmm. publicly visible to anyone. But if it connects, you know, certain things that it's like, hey, how do I prove that I'm a real person without giving you my information? Mm -hmm. And the cool thing about Web3 now is like really the smartest people that I'm meeting are all moving into Web3. They're like, we're leaving, you know, traditional legacy companies, tech companies, banks, finance and going into Web3. So the innovation and creativity that's going to be there is really yeah, uh, unparalleled, which yeah. I which I enjoy. I like love getting to be a part of that. So thank you guys for talking about all like what it means for the users, like combining actual goods with NFTs. Now, can we please talk a, a little bit about what kind of tangible items are most suitable for it to be combined with NFTs? I would well. My vision is, I think, five to ten years now, maybe three to five years, that all things should have a digital twin, an NFT. But in order to achieve that mass market adoption, we have to start somewhere. And my opinion is to start with luxury goods for two reasons. First of all, they are they have more collectible and trading value. Mm -hmm. So we can really prove the use case of attaching it to NFT. And in the luxury market are usually trendsetters. Usually they start something and then the mass market follow. Mm. 
I mean, that makes perfect sense. I, I definitely agree as far as the luxury side goes, but I think you know our particular focus and where we think the NFTs makes the most sense in this case is luxury goods that are often stored or vaulted. Because the idea over here is when you, well, you know, for example, wine, whiskey, things that are put away to you know age properly to stay secure, diamonds. Um, because the issue you have over there is you might own it, you might have the value, but to prove it or to then reach uh, achieve marketability and achieve liquidity with that you know with that good or that collectible, you know, comic books, baseball cards means you have to take it out of storage, go to an auction house or to a broker or you know, someplace where you can sell it. So anything that you would keep in a safety deposit box or that you would keep in a vault or in a warehouse um, that has value, especially you know, luxury and collectible goods in our opinion, is perfectly mirrored in an NFT because and that gives you the ability to have both that safety, that security, and that insurance from that you want for your for your collectible, for your luxury item, while also having instant access to liquidity in a marketplace. Mm -hmm. So that's really how we see it. And you know, we started with whiskey for a whole bunch of reasons. One of them, you know, just the, the whole inefficiencies. Mm -hmm. But you know, wine and whiskey are things that are often you know stored in temperature-controlled warehouses and insured, and they're left there to age and to improve. You know, whiskey in the barrel sits mm -hmm. in warehouses and ages. You can't even take it out to bring it to your home. Mm -hmm. So we think that those are like natural fit. For, for the NFT market mm. because people are, they want the value, they want to know that they own it, but mm. they also already aren't really holding on to them to begin with. Mm. Um, yep. So yeah, anything that people would store basically, and, and you know, from our perspective, but definitely agree on the luxury side. I think luxury is absolutely right. the answer. Yeah. Yeah. I'm all for democratizing the technology, and I mm. think that anything in the future should have an NFT chip. Oh. oh, I think it's I think that's a great point. Yeah. My honestly, my biggest concern with that is just like the future of IoT, mm. like how we're getting so many more with like you know we have these issues now with people are concerned about, um, you know their 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 smart homes recording them or feeding data back. And, yeah. yeah. You know your Roomba is going to now map your entire home yeah. and sell that yeah. data for you because you know Amazon <laughs> yeah. just did something right. with them. I so. Know. Yeah. yeah, I think there is like too much of monopoly exists mm. in the world, mm -hmm. and uh, I'm certainly not very secure about how our data has been used by like different providers. So yeah, that's really what concerns me is less the NFT idea because I think you know those are pretty good on it's privacy. Like one-way data. Screen. Exactly, yeah. it needs to be one way. I don't want it to be that like I'm wearing a sweatshirt and then like, you know. The Starbucks, you know, cup has an IoT reader that like pings that like someone in this sweatshirt. Yeah. And I wouldn't even mind it necessarily if it was just reporting that information back to the brand anonymously. But what I don't like is that Starbucks definitely has my own personal information for mm. my credit card usage, and that they'd be able to then say, "Oh, we can now link the name to the wallet that owns this item." Mm -hmm. That I don't want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, at the same time, thinking about that same feature, that'd be much harder to steal luxury goods because the idea that an IoT can ping the NFT reader would be yeah. like, hey, this item just appeared in this in this airport and we know it was reported and you know stolen to the police over here. Like <laughs> so you got but it's the same thing of weighing privacy and these types of things of yeah. how do you get it to really maintain the anonymity. Yeah. Yeah. That's why marketplace like us or like market leaders mm -hmm. have to help step in, set the rules mm -hmm. of the game. Right. Yeah. yeah. Or at least like we need to contribute to influence the different mm -hmm. protocols and yeah. projects to yeah. to behave in a way or to to create the services that the user actually needs. Mm. Right? Yeah. Um, now we we talked a lot about okay what NFTs means to the average users. Why do we create like NFTs together with the physical mm. goods? Uh, I want to talk about a bit about the current adoption for for the physical items with NFTs. Mm -hmm. like, uh, how how has the bis business ongoing with you? Yeah, so I mean, on our, it's been great. We were, originally when we set out, we were hoping to have about $2 million worth of whiskey, you know, on our platform that people contribute, you know, sent in to have authenticated and stored. Mm -hmm. um, we have $8 million worth of bottles already and about $25 million worth of barrels and casks full of whiskey that are on the platform. Mm -hmm. So kind of shattered our own expectations mm -hmm. by a good 15x on that, uh -huh. um, which has been really both encouraging, surprising, and also really, um, uh, you know, really, really inspiring in terms of like, okay, there's clearly market demand for this, for us to be able to give people who haven't had historical mm -hmm. access to whether it's, you know, barriers of entry to the market, mm -hmm. uh, data, um, just access to buy, mm -hmm. like we said, you know, people all over. Mm -hmm. So so that's been a really, really great sign because like, you know, you had mentioned there's the supply side and the demand side. So we really went after the supply side first that we said, you know what, we know the demand is out there. We know that there's, you know, literally over a billion dollars a year worth of these sales taking mm -hmm. place. But we want to make sure that we have enough supply so that when people come on to trade to yeah. see what's out there, there's you know products that they've been looking for mm -hmm. that this bottle, oh my god, I drank this with my grandfather in 1983, I haven't seen it since, and now they can go on and actually buy that bottle again. So we've really, uh, thankfully, it's been great to us, and 
I'd say, uh, you know, interestingly, and this is something that's just, you know, been theorized, but we noticed that as the, you know, traditional markets collapsed, a lot of the um, alternative asset markets have really increased, luxury goods, um, whiskey, wine, you know, rare spirits. So that's been something that we've noticed, which has definitely contributed, I'd say, to the growth of uh, user onboarding in terms of collectors who are saying, hey, you know what, maybe I want to either put some money into these types of things, or if I have them in my house, maybe it's worth putting it onto the platform where I can get these secondary tang tangential benefits that I wouldn't be able to get otherwise. Mm, yeah. So we are pre-launch. We are launching in fall this year. Um, but I can address the current market, mm -hmm. how the fashion brands are trying to get into Web3 and, and NFT. So a lot of times, the way I see them mm -hmm. is that they feel like usually NFT first. They felt that the way for them to enter Web3 and become or work with NFT is to piggyback off an existing NFT um, franchise, which is not the case. Because I've interviewed 200 brands, and their one and only goal is to sell what they already produce, mm -hmm. which is physical goods. Mm -hmm. So there's no reason for them to sort of bend backwards to work with an NFT project and to produce additional goods just for the NFT project. So I'm trying to bring it back sort of to mm -hmm. the way it should be, which is that the, that the technology, the NFT, should be working for you, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. That makes I perfect think, sense. Yeah, yeah, you, you bring out like a very interesting, mm -hmm. or, or I think like makes sense with most of the people, but for Web3 world, we don't think, like most of the people don't think that way, right? Mm -hmm. We think you should create new digital items for the NFT project that's right. completely new. Yeah, yeah. But we're going to address that later. Yeah. Um, and then now let's talk a bit about our future expectation. Mm -hmm. But I think we already addressed that in a lot of way, but uh, I guess it's time for us to talk about like what are your future plan for the next 12 months? Like, what do you plan to achieve? Sure, so we have our first vault uh, set up already in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. um, I'm traveling, uh, catching a plane after this to go to France to actually visit. We're building a vault out in France right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so the next 12 months, I'd say our goal is to have about six vaults hopefully worldwide um, in different you know locations in the United States and the, around the world so that we can really yeah, yeah so that we can really globalize like the market in that sense like really enable global access where it's not just people from America who can sell and trade their whiskey, but it's people from Europe, people from the UK, people from uh, Asia, you know, all over the world, basically. That's really one of the things that we're aiming for is to really, really, because that gives you both access to a whole new buyer, you know, a whole new market where if you have products that people are looking for halfway around the world, especially when it comes to limited edition releases of whiskeys where there's only 150 bottles, there's a ton of people who are looking for those bottles who can't find them. So you're able to now give them that access and that ability to really own things, which people, you know, people do love ownership. Mm -hmm. um, so that's really a, a, one of our big pushes. On the other side, it would be, you know, just a lot more in terms of like the use a bit like a user user facing side, like a lot of UI and UX features that we're planning on integrating into Vaxis. Um, like I had mentioned earlier, so we're in the process of getting launched uh, the lending portion. So people will actually be able to, you know, take their collection, put it onto Baxis, and then take a loan out against it. Mm -hmm. um, and as well, we're also filing, you know, we were discussing this earlier, but the idea of like, uh, we're filing certain paperwork with the SEC to actually allow us to then fractionalize certain mm -hmm. assets so that we can legally have people trade fractions, you know, that will be mm -hmm. recognized securities, but fractions in, again, assets that have real trackable value and, uh, you know, in terms of both the public and private markets. Mm, wow. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah, really looking forward to that. And, and I do it. Well, you have to. So I'll With say you have whiskey. to. Yeah. yeah, great whiskey, and we're at the, uh, the place I'm traveling in France actually, uh, Chateau de Brille. Um, mm. So they produce Calvado, which is like an apple brandy, but they have a castle on the property um, from like mm -hmm. the 16th century, and they just renovated it. So one of the really cool things is that mm. if you buy one of their brands NFTs, mm -hmm. um, you can come obviously to redeem it at the castle, pick up the bottle, you know, try it. But you also get to stay in the castle, like you yeah. get to sleep there, and like that's one of those things you were talking about. That yeah. brand engagement is like, hey, cool, it's really cool that I could buy your alcohol and your spirits but like mm -hmm. I also get to stay on a castle yeah. on your property like that's yeah. like that's a real benefit of ownership yeah, we, we not go there for free okay? yeah. So, yeah exactly we'll do we'll do the yeah. next interview at the castle Which I think is the true value mm -hmm. of attaching an NFT to a physical item you like we are human beings right. we need that in person interaction mm -hmm. like it's nice to be visiting the shot in the metaverse but mm -hmm. it's it's not, never gonna be as nice as visiting that in person uh, mm -hmm. I totally yeah. agree and like yeah I'm just thinking like even from that like 
I mean, we have all of these types of token-gated memberships, like airport lounges, where you need to either be flying a certain class on an airline or have a certain yeah. credit card. Or have, why don't we have those like all over, where it's like, hey, you're in a random city, and it's like you own one of these NFTs. Well, we all, you know, have space over yeah. here. You can rent, a, get a hotel room. You can do it. Yeah. So it's this ability to build that, you know, community also through brand partnerships yeah. in a way that they couldn't before. Absolutely. Yeah. What about you, Vivian? Uh, so we, uh, I can't really um, review who we're, who we're launching with. Okay. But just stay tuned for the next. Um, in the, we will be launching in fall. Okay. Um, our our um, brand partners are um, luxury goods producers. We have some interesting categories ranging from home decor to fashion to um, novelty objects, tech objects. So we have a range of products that mm. are that we're bringing them a new life to NFT, to AR, mm. and um, to interesting and exciting technologies. I'm excited. Really? Yeah. I'm excited. Uh, I feel like I'm gonna have so many sponsors. <laughs> the luxury girls and goods mm -hmm. and everything. Yeah, no, but that's 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 really exciting, and I'm really excited to yeah. see how you do it. Because one of the coolest things about Web three, like you had mentioned, this open spirit of collaboration, is that like yeah. ideas keep getting improved on by other mm -hmm. people. Like we're in different but similar spaces, trying to work on similar technologies. So like, you know, tech that we work on, we create. Like you know, code, we we open source it. Like mm -hmm. we we let other people use it because we're like, hey, we're gonna make the like you said, setting this industry standard. We're gonna make a better, more sustainable, safer industry. If like your you know crypto code, it can be mm -hmm. audited and publicly viewed, so people mm -hmm. aren't interacting acting with you know harmful you know hazardous contracts um, which I think we've all seen a little too much yeah. of unfortunately yeah. um, so that's re that's really cool that's really really cool yeah yeah I'm really excited about the future growth mm -hmm. for both of your projects, and I'm really looking forward to all those collaborations. Mm -hmm. I'm going to the vault, enjoying the whiskey, mm -hmm. doing the luxury brands. Just kidding. <laughs> hey, well, we'll do that. Yeah, you know, lug yeah. Luxury, ver you know, whiskey collaboration over here. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and and uh, I think we already covered a lot of content today, mm -hmm. and let's enter our next part, which is. The I think it's the funniest part is mm -hmm. everybody needs to share a fun fact about themselves. Not including me, okay? Just the interviewees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ooh. Who wants to start first? Fun fact. Yeah. Um, I like to brag that I'm an avid hiker. I've been to the Everest Space Camp. I okay. tell a lot of people that because it's sort of unexpected for someone who used to work in luxury fashion. Mm. But so that's me. That's really cool. Oh, yeah. I don't have anything nearly as cool. <laughs> Sing harder. Uh, yeah, I gotta think. A fun fact about me? Coolest one? I don't know, but I'd say from a fun fact, like as someone who's, um, you know, in the luxury and in the tech space, it's also pretty funny that like I do things very, very old school. Hmm. Like um, I still have a BlackBerry, which I use like with the buttons oh, because wow. I love having physical buttons on my phone. Financial services. Uh, exactly. Um, I write with like fountain pens instead of like wow. iPads and keyboards because like I like to uh -huh. handwrite things oh, and me uh, too, me too. and like I don't have a vape. Like I I have my grandfather's old pipe that I like wow. sometimes smoke with my pipe. So it's like really old school yes. stuff. Like really appeals to me, which you know works with whiskey, yeah. but is always funny in the Web three tech space where everyone mm -hmm. is so digital about everything and I'm yeah. like yeah have you tried handwriting a note like <laughs> this oh. is really cool though actually yeah, yeah. 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 I like handwriting I also like uh, yeah, I like real things. That's yeah, it. And that's one of the beauties mm -hmm. of like Web3 was I was like, this is a really, really cool space. But like mm -hmm. people seem to be forgetting that we really like stuff. Like yeah. people really like having things that they can eventually use and yeah. are not just digital. Because I'd say attention spans are getting shorter, not longer. Mm -hmm. And yes. more things that are, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So if you forget something is in one of your, you know, random 900 wallets that you created over the mm -hmm. course of time, like you're going to forget about it. As yeah. opposed to like, hey, I walk into my living room and I see a, yeah. a pen or even a little trinket of something that mm -hmm. like makes me remember a vacation I took or a trip like I'm not looking at my digital wallet necessarily right now to see like what NFTs I got as you know PO apps like for mm -hmm. proof of attendance like I'm looking at the magnets I bought on the trips I took yeah, yeah. let's cheers to the real world we are in with full of surprises and wonderful things yeah cheers cheers <laughs>